ago on this program, I addressed a message to one of the minor discords in the silly symphony which surrounds the Nazi Führer. Tonight I would like to address the Führer himself. This is just an intimate talk between us, so I think we can discard his alias and address him by his right name. Are you listening, Führer? Ah, good. My dear Mr. Schickelgruber, it is much better to use the name which was yours until you changed it to Hitler long before the last war. In fact, Mr. Schickelgruber, it might be a wise move on your part to change back. No one can really be angry at anyone named Schickelgruber. And so many, many people are really angry at the name Hitler. I have been rereading your book, Mein Kampf. I find one paragraph in it very interesting, and I would like to discuss it with you. It is your estimate of the value of propaganda. Your actual words are, by propaganda, with clever and permanent application, even heaven can be palmed off on people as hell and the other way around, the most wretched life as paradise. I wonder if you believe that now. Let us consider the propaganda you send outside of Germany. Honestly, it doesn't fool anyone these days. Oh, it fooled Britain, and it fooled my country for years. It fooled Belgium and Holland and Czechoslovakia and Norway. It didn't fool Russia, though, did it? When you made that pact with Russia in 1939, you declared joyously to the Reichstag, Russia and Germany fought against one another in the world war. This shall not and will not happen again. Then on December 10th, 1940, in a broadcast, you paid a high tribute to the people of Russia and you declared, in a terrible struggle, the Russian people arose and freed themselves from the clique of power-thirsty magnets of finance, trade, raw materials, and industry. Your honeyed words, aimed at lulling Russia into complacent slumber, fell on deaf ears. The Russians remembered what you had said years before on page 538 of Mein Kampf. The present rulers of Russia are blood-stained criminals, the dregs of humanity. The silent man in the Kremlin said nothing, but he remembered and he prepared. On page 539, you said, Bolshevism is an infamous crime against humanity. The silent man in the Kremlin said nothing, but he ordered more airplanes, more tanks. Then came the so-called third in Russia. Here in England and in America, not understanding, we thought it a horrible thing. Had only Poland and Belgium and the other states wiped out their fifth colonists, their fate might have been happy. tells us that purge means to make spiritually or physically clean. That Russian purge disturbed the world, but now we know that the silent man in the Kremlin was eliminating your fifth column in Russia. The Russians are realists. They knew that your eyes were lusting for the wheat fields of the Ukraine, the oil fields of Baku, the industrial plants of Leningrad, 
and years, they knew that fire could be fought only with fire, that those who lived by the sword had to die by the sword. Never again, Mr. Schickel Gruber, can you raise the specter of Bolshevism to frighten those of us who live in democracies. Never again can you rant against the militaristic aims of the Soviet Union. History may say many things of your Russian campaign. History will never say that Russia invaded Germany. You cannot, of course, on the fact that neither America nor England is particularly enamored of the Russian form of government. It is true that both Britain and my country, that's America, by the way, Mr. Schickelgruber, are quite satisfied with our present forms of government. It is equally true that our two democracies feel that Russia's form of government is entirely Russia's business. When I stand as they play the Russian national anthem in London, I am not implying that I favor the communistic structure over the political structure of my own country. I stand with respect as a tribute to the magnificent fight the people of Russia are making to preserve the new world they have created. You, Mr. S., are in the position of the hunter who shouted, I've captured a bear, but he won't let me go. No, your propaganda doesn't fool people anymore, Mr. S. There was a time when we thought Dr. Goebbels to be a very sinister person. We thought that if we removed the boot from his left foot, we might conceivably find that it covered a cloven hook. That was rather foolish of us. Now we realize that the silly little man only wears the trappings of a clown, that he leans on such weak reeds as the English traitor, Joyce, and the American traitor who broadcasts from Berlin under the name of Paul Revere. Of course, you can buy accents, either English or American, but it takes more than accents to win even a war of the wavelength. Every trick that your little Gabby man has tried to work in France has failed. You'll recall that on June 15th last, in an effort to popularize the once greatly respected but now despised Admiral Darland, he ordered every shop in France to display the Admiral's picture. He ordered every newspaper in both occupied and unoccupied France to print a likeness of Darlan on its first page. The order was obeyed. But did your agents notice that somehow most of the pictures in the shop windows happened to fall face downward? Did your agents tell you proudly that every paper in France published Darlan's picture on page one. But did they add, Mr. S., that more than half of the papers printed his picture in the fifth column? And now let's come to this new propaganda campaign which starts tomorrow in America. You know, Mr. S., Britain has eyes and ears 
all over Europe, even in Germany. And here, we know all about your new peace offensive. It has died before it was born. Gabby Goebbels thought he could sell America this bill of goods, and the publicity from his agents there is all set to begin tomorrow. His agents will say, do the people of America know what the land lease bill really means? It means, your agents will thunder, that America is a guarantor of a British victory. By implication, this means, too, that America has a moral obligation to help the allies of Britain. Now the new order has been established in Europe. There is peace in Denmark, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Belgium, Holland, France, Norway, Greece, Yugoslavia. Any American interference or aid will result in civil war in these countries, which are now happy under German protection. If America persists in helping Britain, it will mean chaos on the continent. That is the ingenious argument formulated by yourself and the good doctor. Some of your argument is true. America will continue to help Britain help the people of the countries you have temporarily conquered. You bet there'll be chaos on the continent, and heads will fall, and there will be just retribution. You say there is peace in countries in which you now hold temporary sway? Not peace, Mr. Schicklgrober, but paralysis. A paralysis which will only be temporary. Today the continent is a vast prison under martial law. You're right in saying that under the terms of the land lease bill, my country owes a moral obligation to help Britain put her fallen allies on their feet again. The people of my country won't be surprised tomorrow when you point out that the land lease bill was, in fact, a declaration of war against you. Mr. Schickelgruber, you have given orders to all of the continent which is under your control to publish prominently the speeches of Senator Wheeler, Mr. Hoover, Colonel Lindbergh, and others whom we loosely call isolationists. Don't take too much comfort from their speeches. Don't forget that they are just as American as are those of us who are 100% for even stronger intervention. They follow their own star, and of millions of us think that it is a lone star in an artificial sky, we also realize that this is their privilege, and we would fight rather than have their views suppressed. Mr. Schickelgruber, I hope I've proven to you that you are wasting a lot of right marks on your futile propaganda. Do you think that you have really made the people of Germany believe that their wretched life is paradise? Do you believe that you have made the people of England and America believe that the heaven of freedom they enjoy is actually a hell? Yes. We laugh at your propaganda now. Remember when your Mr. Hess landed here? Poor Dr. Goebbels was in a spot. How could he explain that one away? But he thought of something. He told the world that Hess had come here to save humanity. 
You and I know better than that, Mr. Hess. We know that Hess didn't come here to save humanity. He came here to see humanity. Lies haven't worked, Mr. Hess. Poor little Gabby. He has made so many mistakes. And so have you, Mr. Hess. Your greatest mistake was to awake the dead here in England. When you bombed Plymouth, Francis Drake came out of his legendary past to live once more in the city from which he so often sailed. Remember his song, Mr. Hess? Take my drum to England, hang it by the shore, strike it when the powder's running dry. If the dawn sight Devon, I'll quit the port of heaven, and we'll drum them up the channel as we drum them long ago. And when slap happy Herman's futile fusiliers, bombed and machine gun light ships, do you think then that Nelson slept? Once more Nelson roused, and today his spirit rides the bridge of every ship that flies the British flag. It is dangerous to awake the dead, Mr. S. Do you think then that Wellington slumbers in his grave, or that Allenby sleeps? Old soldiers never die, Mr. S. Do you notice that thousands of naval officers wear their caps at a jaunty angle, half covering one eye? You know then that Beatty, the hero of Jutland, still lives. It is dangerous to awake the dead. Their spirits slip easily from their shrouds to walk the streets of Britain. They live again in the hearts of men and they know that they did not die in vain. They know that this island is as unassailable as truth. These gallant ghosts of the past know that they will be joined soon by thousands of their countrymen, by men and women who are alive tonight. But who in this island fears death if he may then walk with Drake and Nelson and Beatty and the other immortals, it is dangerous to awake the dead. That's all, Mr. S. Yet one more word. Do you think for a moment that a man bearing the name of Winston Churchill will ever bend his knee to anyone named Shickle Gruber? Really, Mr. S. Really.